I have uh, two small announcements. After this uh, speech, there will be a free lunch. Okay, it's not completely free. It's provided by our sponsor, but it's free for you. And the second one, uh, please have a look on our merchandise and uh, the books that are here. Some of them are provided uh, for free. And we can move on with our speech. Our next speaker is a professor of political science uh, at the University of Iceland. And uh, he is a proponent of free markets and classical liberalism. Uh, he is also a co-founder of the Liberty Association in Iceland, which was founded back in 1979 and which organized the visits of uh, Nobel laureates Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, and Friedrich Hayek in Iceland. Please welcome Professor Hannes Gisur Arson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be here in Bulgaria and uh, speak about Iceland. In fact, uh, the country in Europe which comes closest to Iceland in area is uh, Bulgaria. You are 117,000 uh, square kilometers and Iceland is 103,000 uh, square kilometers. But Iceland is a very small, cold, remote country, uh, different from Bulgaria with uh, very few people. But uh, it is quite correct that uh, I invited uh, Milton Friedman to come to Iceland in uh, 1984. And we had a lot of discussions. And uh, what he told me uh, when we were discussing economics, for example, uh, Austrian economics, he said there is no Austrian and non-Austrian economics. There is just good economics and bad economics. And he also said, because some people made the argument, that Iceland was too small for economic uh, laws to apply to Iceland. And he said, well, if it wouldn't apply to Iceland, there wouldn't be economic laws at all. Because uh, people are alike all around, they all respond to prices, uh, they all uh, bear in mind costs, so economic laws have to be general. So they have to be uh, in Iceland, uh, applied to Iceland as well as to other countries. And uh, therefore I think it is uh, interesting for you, uh, who come from much larger uh, countries, to look at this microcosmos and see how the laws of economics can apply to Iceland as they do to other countries. But perhaps I should first uh, give you a glimpse of Iceland. actually this uh, remote uh, strange country unlike anything else it is so strange that uh, when the US uh, government was training their uh, aeronauts uh, the people that went to the moon they first trained them in Iceland because Iceland is supposed to be closest to the moon in terms of landscape but we were settled in Iceland uh, in the years from 1874 to 1930 mainly by Vikings uh, from the western fjords of, of Norway and I think that uh, economic analysis can explain a lot, even though I'm not going to discuss uh, but a few examples. Uh, it uh, can explain how the Icelanders enforced law privately, which is very interesting from the point of view of, say, uh, uh, anarcho-capitalists. How we uh, managed our mountain pastures, which were commons, how, why we lost our independence, uh, how we starved for centuries, uh, despite being close to fertile fishing grounds. Uh, how Icelanders became affluent again. How we manage our fisheries. 
uh, how the banking sector collapsed uh, in 2008, uh, something that made the news all around the world, and uh, how we have uh, uh, risen again uh, in the last few years. But I'm only going to discuss a few of those things, uh, those that I think that libertarians are most interested in. And uh, here we can see something that was also shown uh, in the video. This is Thingvellir, our old parliamentary site. Because in 930, the settlers came and they founded uh, a commonwealth. And that commonwealth was uh, remarkable because it didn't have any government. It, it was ruled by law, but there was no government. And uh, it was a remarkable legal order. No kings, no aristocracy. There were 39 chieftains, uh, and you could choose between the chieftains. So basically, you had competitive protection agencies, somewhat like if some of you are familiar with the work of, uh, of uh, Robert Nozick and Anarchy State and Utopia. He is discussing in the first part of his book protection agencies and how the state can possibly arise or develop out of protection agencies. And we had those 39 comp uh, competing uh, protection agencies in Iceland. If you're a farmer, you said, I'm going to be uh, a member of the chieftaincy of this chieftain. So we had uh, a legal order where the production, uh, pro uh, pro production of law enforcement was more or less uh, privatized. And uh, the law in Iceland, the concept of law was a little bit like the common law tradition, which is so eloquently described by Bruno Leoni in his book, uh, Liberty and the Law. Uh, the law was something that wasn't really legislated. Uh, it was something that had to be discovered. It was the old good law. Uh, and uh, another remarkable feature of the Icelandic law system in the past was that if there were new laws, they had to uh, enjoy unanimous support. And this is basically what the public choice theory would tell us would be efficient. Because the law applies to all, and if a majority uh, passes it, uh, the minority may be coerced. Uh, so if it is to be no co non-coercive, as exchanges in the marketplace are, then uh, you really would need unanimous uh, consent. Uh, it's an interesting uh, observation to make. And the assemblies that met once a year, they made judicial decisions. And uh, what is uh, even more interesting is that those decisions, they were enforced privately. There was no government. So uh, what you did, uh, you had the agreements, uh, you had a case against your neighbor. It was uh, decided on uh, at the assembly, but then it had to be enforced. You couldn't call the police. So you had all kinds of devices to, uh, to enforce the law privately. You had contracts you could uh, sell off your case to somebody else that would enforce it. You could uh, let your chieftain enforce it, and uh, of course you had also the extended family doing it, and so on. And the Icelandic sagas, uh, which uh, describe this period, uh, they are a, a source or a fountain of a lot of stories about this, uh, this um, resolution of uh, disagreements. Uh, it's a very interesting process. And you have to realize that this uh, uh, lasted for 300 years. Some people say, well, it wasn't really successful because eventually it collapsed. But everything collapses. You know, the kingdoms in Europe, uh, they lasted perhaps 50 or 100 or 200 years. And while there was some violence in Iceland, it was much less than in Europe where the kings uh, conscripted uh, farmers and uh, went with armies uh, to other countries and, uh, and uh, had battles and wars. So this private enforcement of law in Iceland worked rather decently in many ways. And uh, another very interesting feature of the system is that uh, uh, the crimes were priced. Let us say that I killed uh, your uh, workman. Uh, then there was a list in the law book about what I had to pay for it. And that list was more or less efficient in the way that uh, I had to pay what would have been your loss from losing your workmen, plus, of course, uh, a, a kind of a fee uh, because uh, you are breaking the law in general. And uh, David Friedman, uh, actually, who is the son of uh, Milton Friedman, has uh, published a very interesting analysis of how efficient the system of pricing crimes were. So in Iceland, we, we didn't, as we didn't have any government and no prisons, we only had the restitution. You committed a crime, and then you had to uh, make even the crime to the victim of the crime. So it was the victim of the crime that benefited from the crime enforcement and not the government. 
uh, sometimes uh, people don't realize how perverse it is. If I murder somebody, that uh, government uh, takes away all my property. What is uh, what, what the point would be to try to do as much as possible to make even the crime to the victim. Uh, although that's a bit difficult if, if it's that, but uh, if it is just a violent act to do something uh, about it. So the Icelandic. Um, the Icelandic legal system of the 930 to 1262 was a system of private uh, engagements uh, in, 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 in crime. But there were also, and I think that some of the anarcho-capitalists that have been uh, discussing the Icelandic example, they have neglected another aspect of the system, which was that there were uh, local communities as well, uh, which everybody had to belong to. You couldn't choose between them. They were geographically uh, determined. Uh, so, even if the farmer, he could choose his chieftain for protection, he couldn't choose his uh, local community, uh, the rapper in I Iceland, which basically took care of uh, mutual insurance and of managing the, uh, the commons. Uh, uh, for in Iceland, uh, as you can see from uh, this uh, slide here, the typical thing was, this is a, a replica of a, a com, of a farm in the Commonwealth period from 930 to 1262, and you can see that the farm is in the valley, and then there are mountains, and uh, the farming in Iceland was sheep farming, so you basically dro drove the sheep to the mountains uh, uh, in spring, and they grazed in the mountains, and then you collected them in the autumn. That was basically how sheep farming was done in Iceland. And uh, then you kept them inside during the winter because the winter in Iceland is cold and dark and, uh, and, and so on. But uh, th th then there is a problem. Uh, if you look at the mountains there on the, on the photograph, it is that each farmer would have a temptation to uh, drive too many sheep uh, of his own uh, to the uh, uh, mountain pastures. Uh, because uh, the benefit of having too many sheep would to come directly to him alone, but the costs, uh, they, they would be distributed over all the local community. And the problem is that uh, one would start doing it and then everybody else would do it. And then you would have what's called in game theory a prisoner's dilemma where everybody is pursuing his or her self-interest, but the uh, result, the consequence will be something that is uh, contrary to the common interest. And uh, the Icelanders, uh, surprisingly perhaps, they developed a solution for this. In the old law book, uh, there, is, uh, there are statutes about this, and basically what they did was to allocate to each farm a quota. So I was a farmer, I could only drive 200 sheep to the mountains, and you were a farmer, you could only drive 150 sheep and so on. So each farm got a quota uh, to drive, and then there was a... Uh, also uh, uh, a rule that uh, the total number of sheep from a community that should be driven to the uh, uh, mountain pasture that uh, belonged to this uh, community, the total uh, number should be uh, decided in such a way that uh, uh, when the sheep returned in, uh, in the autumn from grazing in the summertime, they should be as fat as possible. And if you would be an economist, then you would see that this is uh, the right kind of opt optimization, because what we have to do is to maximize the output of the uh, mountain pastures and to do that by grazing in such a way that the sheep will be as fat as possible. So we had this little example in Iceland uh, of something which uh, perhaps uh, not too many people pay attention to, of how you, how you solve a real economic problem, uh, the problem that has often in the literature been called uh, the tragedy of the commons. Uh, well, uh, this was based on tradition. It wasn't really something that just happened. You know, and nobody knows uh, why, why, why we allocated 150 sheep to one, 200 to other. It's just something that was traditional. Uh, <clears throat> but in, the, in, in, in a few centuries, from, uh, from about uh, 1400 to about 1800, Iceland was desperately poor, desperately poor. Uh, uh, and this is extraordinary. Uh, because Iceland has fertile fishing grounds. And what was the reason Iceland was so poor? It was that uh, foreigners were forbidden to stay in the country, 
Uh, therefore, there was no foreign capital which was invested in fisheries. The Icelanders only used uh, the fertile fishing grounds in small open rowing boats, which is an extremely inefficient way of doing it. And why was that? Why didn't uh, 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 large fishing firms develop in Iceland and fishing villages as you would uh, ha have uh, presumed? It was because the law prohibited it. There was a law that uh, coerced everybody to be a farmhand. You could only be a, a farmer, own a farm, or be uh, employed by a farmer. And this was uh, <coughs> because the king and the land-owning land class, they combined to make agriculture the only legal profession in Iceland. The fisheries was not uh, accepted as a profession, because if it had been, then probably the king would have lost Iceland because uh, English or German uh, fishermen would have taken it. So uh, also uh, the, the king set all prices, and the prices for, uh, for uh, fish was uh, set much lower than ma uh, the world market price, and the price for agricultural products was set much higher. This meant that the fisheries were stifled. They were uh, not able to develop and grow and flourish in Iceland. And this was the reason Iceland was uh, extremely poor for about four or five hundred years. So in this uh, country with a rather harsh climate, the only thing that people really did full time was to work on the 5,000 farms that existed in the country. And uh, this uh, system collapsed uh, in the mist famine in 1784 to 85. And it is a kind of an anecdote. Uh, uh, there was a great volcanic eruption in Iceland in uh, uh, 1783 to 1784. And it resulted in a famine. But what's really interesting is that there was a mist that, uh, that uh, went from Iceland with the winds to the rest of Europe and caused bad harvests in Europe in the uh, 80s. And this uh, meant that the, the price of bread went up in France. And this was one of the causes of the French Revolution. So you can actually trace uh, the French Re Revolution partly to the missed uh, uh, phenomenon in Iceland as a result of a volcanic eruption. Uh, but uh, Iceland, uh, sadly, was, uh, because it was so poor, a marginal, unwanted country for uh, four or five hundred years. Uh, the Danish kings, they tried uh, three times to sell Iceland to Henry VIII. Uh, then uh, another king tried to sell it to the uh, German merchants. And uh, in uh, 1785, uh, the uh, island was obviously of zero value because the Danes were thinking about evacu evacuating uh, Iceland after the volcanic eruptions. It just move everybody away. It was so harsh. Uh, about 25% uh, of the population perished in famines and, uh, and so on because of the volcanic eruptions. And then uh, in the early uh, 19th century, the British were thinking about annexing it three times and they could easily have done so, but they didn't bother to. They, they just <laughs> didn't feel it was worth it. And uh, when, no uh, when Sweden got Norway from uh, uh, from Denmark, uh, they didn't even ask for Iceland. Iceland had been a Norwegian dependency uh, since 1262, and they didn't ask for, uh, for Iceland, just didn't bother about it. Uh, this only illustrates how desperately poor the country was, as a result of misguided economic policies for 500 years previously. And uh, even more humiliating may be that uh, after the uh, American support, Alaska, William Seward was the Secretary of State, he, he was considering uh, buying Iceland, that he had a report made uh, about this. But when the congressmen got the wind of this, uh, they laughed and said, are you really going to buy the glaciers and cases of Iceland? Ha, 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 it's worth nothing. So uh, Seward withdrew the, the idea of buying Iceland. I super, I'm not entirely sure that they could have uh, done so. I don't think Iceland was really in the offing. But it is an interesting illustration of how poor the country was, that nobody wanted it. But uh, what emerged uh, in the late 19th century and also in the 20th century is that uh, uh, Iceland has uh, a, a one great natural resource, the, the, the fertile fishing grounds, especially with the cod. And uh, another anecdote is that one of the reasons we were able to uh, find uh, and to discover America was the cod, because cod uh, is uh, easily preserved over long voyages. 
There is a very interesting little book by Mark Kulanski who writes about food for the International Herald Tribune. It's called The Biography of the Cod, where he explains uh, how cod, uh, dried cod, made possible all these voyages over the Atlantic. Uh, you know what Oscar Wilde said, because we discovered America in the year 1000, uh, and uh, Oscar Wilde said, well, the Icelanders discovered America, but they had a the good sense to lose it again. <laughs> but I think that's a bit unfair, though. Uh, <coughs> So we had fertile fishing grounds, we had the cod, and uh, that, uh, uh, that's something that changed uh, the situation in Iceland in late 19th century and early 20th century. And uh, what happened was, actually, that uh, uh, in the 70s, in the 50s to 70s, we acquired uh, a 200 miles uh, exclusive economic zone. And that was essential, because there had been over-harvesting of uh, the, the the fish stocks in the Icelandic fishing grounds before then, and we could only start to manage uh, the fisheries when we had acquired uh, jurisdiction over the 200 miles. And here you can see the zone, the 200 miles zone. So uh, I've sometimes called in my history about Iceland, this was the enlargement of Iceland uh, from the 103,000 square kilometers that we had land to the 700,000 square kilometers uh, of, uh, of, of sea. And in this uh, exclusive economic uh, zone, there are uh, enormous uh, resources, mostly though the fish stocks. And uh, what we did, and I'm just going to explain that for, for, just for a few minutes, what we did was to develop an efficient system of managing the fish stocks in Iceland and solving the tragedy of the commons. And uh, this we did by allocating fishing rights. Because uh, fishing grounds are similar to the mountain pastures that I uh, discussed before, uh, there is a temptation to up boats uh, to uh, the fleet until uh, profit is zero. As there is a temptation for the farmer to add sheep to uh, the flock uh, driven to the mountain. It is the same kind of problem really. Uh, if, if, uh, as Aristotle po uh, pointed out, something that everybody owns, nobody takes care of. Uh, this is also another way of uh, putting the tragedy of the commons. And uh, the herring collapsed as a result of overfishing in the uh, late 1960s. Uh, that was a shadow cast over Icelandic history. And uh, we solved it by individual catch quotas and herring <coughs> that soon became uh, transferable. And then in 1977, the, the very important cod stock also came close to collapsing. And uh, what we did was to, to try to find a system uh, that would really take care of this and, uh, and stop overfishing. And this we did. Uh, we found a system, developed a system by a trial and error method. In uh, 1984, more or less, it was imposed and, uh, with a comprehensive legislation in, in 1990. And what we have now is a system of fisheries which is both sustainable and profitable. Even if, the, pr the problem is also, the solution is also a problem because actually the fisheries are so profitable in Iceland that, that there's a lot of resentment towards the owners of fishing firms that uh, see all this profit coming to them uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, so that's a separate problem created by the solution. But I'm just going to uh, explain a little bit uh, the, the problem. I think this actually can be quite simply put. Uh, you see the, here effort, effort in uh, terms of number of boats. Uh, if there is zero boats, then there is zero catch. Uh, two boats, uh, the catch goes up and so on. And at some time, the catch is going to go down. That, that's just a biological uh, law, more or less. The catch uh, will uh, increase with effort until it uh, reaches a kind of a maximum, and that's called um, the maximum sustainable yield, and then it will go uh, down. But the cost, uh, which is represented there on the graph with the uh, uh, blue line, uh, that's more or less linear. Uh, one boat, uh, x cost, uh, two boats, two x costs, uh, three boats, three x, uh, x cost, and so on. So you see that uh, the income is uh, the red, uh, uh, red line, and the cost is the, uh, is the blue line. And, uh, and now we see what will happen with open access. With open access, you will add boats until you reach the limit, where there is no uh, profit. And uh, in, uh, I have constructed this example in such a way that this limit is at 16 boats. You can see it on the graph. On, uh, when you have 16 boats, 
uh, harvesting uh, the same fishing grounds, then you will have zero profit because there are 16 boats and there are uh, far too many. Then I usually, when I give this craft to my students, I ask them what should we do. I would uh, I, uh, tell them that uh, at 10 boats, you will have the maximum sustainable yield. You, you see that from the graph. At 10 boats, maximum sustainable yield. And then uh, I ask, what is the best economic uh, policy for, uh, in fishing? And many of them say 10 boats with maximum sustainable yield. But that's not the correct answer. Because you are fishing in order to have profit. So the uh, point which you should aim at would be the point where there is where there's the largest distance between the cost, the blue line, and uh, the income, uh, the red line. And that is actually, uh, as I construct the example, at eight boats. If you just look at the graph, then you see this. With open access, you have uh, 16 boats harvesting fish. And if you could move to eight boats, then you would have uh, more, more uh, actually, income and uh, less effort. And the profit would be the difference between the blue line and uh, the red uh, line there. So you see the problem. And therefore, you will also see uh, the solution. The problem is that with open access, uh, the uh, uh, boats will uh, multiply. Uh, new boats will be added until we get to 16 boats. That's the problem. But the solution is to move back. And how did we move back? We did a simple thing. We gave to the fishing firms, let's say to the 16 boat owners, in this example, quotas. So each of them could get, say, 5% or 3% of uh, the total allowable catch. And then they could transfer the quotas between them. And this means that over time, the eight more efficient boat owners will buy out the less efficient boat owners and move the quota to their boats and send off the uh, extra boats. So you will, by uh, free and voluntary trade, go down from 16 boats to eight boats if you have individual transferable quotas. And then the, uh, uh, the total allowable catch will be set by the Marine Biological Institute in Iceland. That's a different story. But uh, th this is basically what happens. And this is illustrated by the, the, the green arrow there, that you move from 16 boats uh, to 8 boats, and then you're able to capture a lot of profit that is uh, otherwise dissipated. And this is the reason. Uh, in this graph, you see the reason why Iceland is to, uh, today an affluent country, because we were able to capture the profit, the possible profit from the fisheries that had been dissipated before and uh, having too many boats chasing after too few fish. Uh, so this is a simple and efficient solution, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the eight boats that are too many, they are uh, brought out, they are not driven out. And uh, uh, it was essential uh, to the system that uh, the quota should in the beginning be allocated free of charge uh, to uh, people on the basis of their cuts history. This meant that people continued to do what they always had done peacefully, and then when you grew old or if you were not terribly efficient, then you sold it to somebody who was more efficient, and uh, slowly the free market uh, contracted the uh, effort to what was uh, uh, efficient. And uh, this is uh, what is called uh, a parallel optimal solution because nobody was worse off with this. Uh, those who continued fishing, they were well off. Those who sold their quotas and left the fishery, they were also well off. And uh, since the uh, fisheries became profitable, the government was also w uh, well off. And uh, it takes too long, and I'm not going to go into it now, but uh, proposals to solve the problem by uh, taxation or auction uh, are, are, in my opinion, non-starters because they didn't uh, take into consideration the interests of those who already were fishing. Because there were 16 boats fishing and you had to look at all the 16. And uh, eight of them would not accept to have to leave the fishery uh, uh, just at one uh, stroke of the pen. So you had to create a process by which the more efficient remained and the less efficient left. So that was done in the Icelandic fisheries. So if you are a new fisher, if you want to become a fisher, you have to buy uh, the right to fish from a business person, not from the state, right? Yes. So and the, the, the business, the fisherman owns the right to fish yes. for all his life, for 
Uh, yes, well, uh, he doesn't, you know, he can sell it. But uh, uh, it has to be, uh, because I always get this question, what about the newcomers and so on? Well, the problem in the fisheries was that there are too many people. So it shouldn't be made very easy for uh, people to enter the fishery because the problem was that uh, it was too easy to enter the fishery. Nowadays, uh, if you want to fish, you have to buy not only the boat, but also the quota. But this is precisely the same thing as if you want to farm. You have to buy the land and you also have to buy the livestock. You know, if you wouldn't have to buy the livestock, there would be no livestock left in the end because it would be free, uh, the access to it. And another very important thing is then you could argue that uh, uh, with this system, uh, it's true, uh, everybody else is excluded. So nobody uh, that doesn't have hold a quota can fish. But what right are those who are outside the fishery deprived of? They are only deprived of the right to fish at zero profit. Because under, uh, uh, under uh, open access, uh, there will be zero profit because uh, there will be too many uh, boats uh, fishing. And what is a right to operate at zero profit? It's worth zero. So nothing was really taken away from those people. You just instigated or, or developed the same system in the fisheries as you have elsewhere in agriculture with the enclosure of land in the past and so on. And uh, now I come to a kind of a <laughs> eco trip in a way because I was very much involved with the policies of the Icelandic uh, uh, governments in 1991 to 2004. Uh, we were young libertarians, uh, liberal ideas were very influential in Iceland. Hayek and Friedman and Buchanan came to Iceland and many others and we translated their books. I translated the road to serfdom and capitalism and freedom and so on and we had some impact on the Icelandic scene and a very good friend of mine who became uh, prime minister on the 30th of April 1991 and uh, that very evening we went out to celebrate and you see uh, me there uh, 30 years ago and 30 kilos ago. So uh, this was 30th April 1991 when Daniel Olsson, my friend who is in the center, he formed this Swiss government uh, with a very strong free market agenda. And uh, in the next uh, uh, years uh, we uh, increased economic freedom in Iceland considerably. Here you can see the plot. The look at uh, the years from 1991 to 2004. And uh, economic freedom in Iceland increased uh, uh, very much uh, during that period. So that in 2004, when Daniel Olsson stepped down as prime minister, Iceland was actually had the freest economy of, of, the, of the five Nordic countries. And we were the 14th freest economy in the world. Uh, from about uh, 80 or 90 uh, economies measured. So uh, this was considerable achievement in 1991 to 2004 in terms of making the society a more liberal society. And uh, we did a lot of things privatized, uh, uh, deregulated, uh, opened up the economy and so on. But I'm just going to give you one example of a very successful uh, economic uh, policy in Iceland. What we did was to uh, lower uh, the corporate income tax. We actually lowered a lot of other taxes, like the, the death tax or the state tax, and so on. So we lowered it from 50% to 18%. Okay, you can see it there. But what happened was that the uh, tax revenue increased for a reason explained by uh, Arthur Laffa and uh, with the Laffa curve, which is this, that uh, tax revenue is not a constant. Uh, the tax base can actually increase uh, if you uh, lower taxes because more people work, uh, there is more, more creation of wealth and so on. And this is also illustrated, by the way, by the fact that uh, Sweden and Switzerland, they have about 10 million each. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, the uh, tax rate in, 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 in Sweden was um, about the same, uh, was about 60% of GDP, and the tax rate in, in Switzerland was about 30. Uh, <coughs> Uh, per GDP, 30% of GDP, but the uh, tax revenue of both countries was about the same, about $1,000 uh, per person. So you could get the same revenue from a 30% tax as from a 60% tax because the tax base itself was uh, much greater. Uh, the Swedes realized this and they have been liberalizing the economy uh, ever since then. But this is an interesting example of uh, how you can, by lowering taxes, uh, create uh, incentives for people to produce more, and thus the tax base increases, and then the revenue will eventually increase. 
uh, an illustration of the Luffer curve, uh, which doesn't apply uh, everywhere. You mustn't overstate the case for the Luffer curve, but definitely there are examples of this uh, Luffer effect, and uh, this is one of them in Iceland. I could actually give uh, a few more examples of this. So we had uh, stabilization, the inflation went down, the government uh, the deficit disappeared because we used the uh, uh, proceeds from the private uh, companies to pay up the public debt. And uh, we opened up the economy, privatized, uh, we uh, cut taxes, uh, we created a sustainable pension system. In fact, the Icelandic pension system is one of the strongest in the world. Uh, the only one which is uh, slightly uh, stronger is the Dutch one. But uh, the Dutch and the Icelandic ones, they are really the strongest pension systems in the world. And they are sustainable. And one of the problems in Europe now is that uh, the pension systems in uh, Europe are not sustainable, as I think many of you will know. Uh, and uh, then we uh, increased protection of uh, individual rights. And uh, then we left, uh, well, my friend left power. We, we, the other, we didn't have any power. We sort of gave advice on the 15th of September 2004. And uh, when we sort of looked back uh, at this dinner that we had uh, on this night of the 15th of September 2004, we were pretty pleased with our uh, uh, efforts for the last, uh, for the previous 14 years. Uh, but then, what went then wrong? Because uh, soon after there was a collapse. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, in retrospect, we can say that uh, in the years from 2004 to 2008, um, the market capitalism that we had built up and developed in Iceland uh, changed into crazy capitalism. There was a handful of businessmen, oligarchs, that took power, and they controlled major business companies, and they controlled more or less all the media. Uh, and uh, even though we were supposed to be right-wing free market people, uh, they were in opposition to us because we, we just wanted to, uh, we, we were concerned with the taxpayer, with the consumer, with, with the, the common man in the street. Uh, none of us uh, thought of ourselves as defenders of the rich. We were defenders of the opportunity to become rich. Uh, I think that's really the main uh, task of, uh, of liberty, to create such opportunities. You may be poor, but what is really important is uh, which way you are going up or down, and we wanted people to be able to go up, if they were, uh, if they were hard working. And those oligarchs, they used the good reputation which had been created in 1991 to 2004 to obtain immense credit uh, elsewhere. It's uh, just staggering how the credit, uh, uh, credit bubble in Iceland uh, uh, expanded. Uh, and uh, then Iceland lost its strategic position because the cold war ended and it was not necessary anymore uh, for, uh, uh, it was called uh, the unsinkable aircraft carrier in the cold war and uh, the US lost interest in Iceland. Uh, so when the financial crisis came, uh, even if the US Fed helped all other countries in Europe, uh, for example, uh, the Central Bank, the National Bank of Switzerland, and uh, the Scandinavian banks uh, with immense uh, dollar swap deals, which enabled those central banks to give liquidity to their uh, banks, they refused this to Iceland. Only country that they refused uh, the, these dollar swap deals to uh, was Iceland. It was uh, thought of as being small and dispensable and having uh, expanded its banking sector beyond what was reasonable. So they just let us go. They left us out in the cold. And, uh, the United Kingdom, or the Labour government of the United Kingdom, they uh, imposed an anti-terrorist law on Iceland. You know, they uh, basically uh, wrote a list of terror... Well, there was on the uh, um, Treasury's website a list of terrorist organizations. Uh, the pa Taliban, uh, the Al-Qaeda, uh, the government of Sudan, the government of North Korea, and uh, the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance of Iceland. <laughs> it was uh, just a staggering for the Icelanders who do not even have a military. Iceland doesn't have a military. And this was because they thought that the Icelandic banks had taken advantage of uh, British uh, depositors and so on. They were angry and they really wanted to knock down this uh, small upstart, the Icelanders. And this uh, basically uh, made things much more difficult for us uh, than they did. I'm actually finishing in a while. I think I'll finish and then take questions. So. Um, and then the UK government, the Labour government, also closed down uh, the British banks owned by Icelanders at the same time as they presented an immense rescue package for all other banks in, in, uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. 
and it has turned out now, because uh, there have been in a resolution process, the, Ic the Icelandic oil banks, that they were completely solvent. <laughs> they have... Uh, uh, they have basically a uh, recovery rate of 100 uh, pence per pound, that is to say, uh, they have recovered all their debts, uh, even if there has been immense uh, costs of, uh, of uh, uh, accountants and lawyers, uh, 150 million pounds or something like that. So, so this is what happened. So Iceland, this small country in the far north, was left out in the cold. And then the final uh, slide here is, why has Iceland risen again? Well, because it never fell. Iceland was never bankrupt, even if Gordon Brown, Prime Minister Gordon Brown said so. And the Icelandic economy is uh, really, um, you know, it was a blessing in disguise when the rest of the world uh, decided not to help us. Because this meant that it didn't take on the liabilities of the banks, so we could move out of the financial crisis without those liabilities, unlike many other countries. Uh, but uh, there are four pillars of the Icelandic economy, uh, profitable fisheries, as I've described, and I've described why they are so profitable, uh, uh, quite uh, different from most other fisheries in the world. I should note, however, that uh, New Zealand has the same system of individual transferable quotas, and they are being adopted uh, slowly in some of the South American countries uh, like Chile and Peru and uh, parts of Argentina, and they are also in parts of the East Coast in the US and Canada. So they are slowly gaining ground. The, uh, ITQs. We have a booming tourist industry. You saw uh, the uh, glimpse of Iceland, and, and uh, I have come to realize just by listening to foreigners that uh, this is a very strange country. You know, it is unlike anything else in the world, very peculiar. So uh, the tourists uh, like that, they are not coming to Iceland for sun or fun. They are coming to Iceland to see the majestic landscape, this empty country, uh, this barren uh, <coughs> land and uh, the glaciers and so on. Then we have considerable energy resources that we invested a lot in, and the investment is now beginning to bear uh, fruit. Uh, uh, both geothermal power, you saw that uh, there, and, and uh, hydroelectric power. And then we have uh, uh, a lot of human capital, like the other Nordic countries. It's a well-educated uh, workforce. Uh, I think that uh, the remaining problems in Iceland are that, for example, capitalism, that used to reign supreme uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, was totally discredited by the bank collapse. There is no question about that. The oligarchs that took over from us, they, uh, they sort of uh, discredited capitalism very much. Uh, the Icelanders are also very innocent people, so they don't really uh, realize, uh, uh, I think, the ways of the world. And uh, there is a lack of moderation and self-control in Iceland. The Icelanders have not really uh, seen or felt anything bad uh, in, in their lives, so they are quite innocent, and this can be a problem. Uh, nevertheless, I think Iceland, uh, that was settled in 1874 to 930, and then uh, was uh, independent uh, as a commonwealth from, t uh, from 930 to 1262, and again uh, in the 20th century, uh, is a remarkable experiment of a small nation that has uh, survived uh, against all odds and even been able to uh, build for itself uh, some affluence. And uh, when Milton Friedman came to Iceland in 1984, he was asked, do you have in one word the solution for Iceland? Yes, I do, Friedman said. And uh, the reporter said, uh, very surprised, which word is that? Liberty. Thank you. Thank you for the great uh, insights about uh, the liberty in Iceland. Now we have uh, 15 good minutes for questions and uh, you are ready for, with the first question. Please. Thank you. Um, uh, as I visited Iceland uh, this summer, uh, to me it was uh, very interesting how this country that uh, uh, the people didn't actually, as they said at least, they said uh, they didn't use and know the will until the Second World War or oh, maybe they were just joking, they moved into the, one of the most uh, developed countries in the world. And uh, it was very interesting to me that uh, m many of the natural resources were privately owned. Like the Gufus uh, waterfall was a good example that I posted in the Facebook group. And we visited a farmer who was in possession of the local water source for the water of the village. So maybe this is another explanation. <laughs> Except the uh, liberty and the uh, private property. But it's private property on the, on the mineral resource. Yes. 
Well, I think uh, just to give a brief answer, absolutely right about this that many of the uh, many of the resources are privately owned in Iceland. Uh, but the problem is that the government has been trying to uh, capture it. For example, the farmers uh, on the coast they used to have uh, ownership in. Uh, in the sea uh, next to the coast, but they are trying to take that away from them and also the commons, the mountain pastures, to uh, proclaim them as being government owned. And I think that one of the tasks of us who believe in private property rights uh, is to try to hinder this uh, development. Okay. Uh, Hannes, you probably remember the Montpellier Society meeting in, uh, in Reykjavik in 2005. And there was a, there was a Norwegian colleague who was speaking on the privatization of the oceans. So, oh, oh, what? privatization of the oceans. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, does Iceland make any sort of attempt, you know, to, to, to influence the global thinking on the privatization of oceans since then? Very good question. In fact, this guy, I organized a meeting in Iceland in 2005, and the guy who gave the paper, uh, yes, uh, was Rögvaldur Hannesson, who is actually an Icelander, but he is a professor of, of resource economics uh, at uh, Bergen, uh, Bergen Commercial School. And uh, you're absolutely right. He gave a very lively presentation on the privatization of the oceans, where he outlined how you could privatize marine resources. And uh, one uh, method of doing so is, of course, the individual transferable quotas that uh, apply quite well to, uh, to fugitive uh, fish stocks uh, in the... Uh, Ocean, but then you could have all kinds of other uh, uh, private property rights, uh, like for example the coral reefs. Uh, you could have local uh, rights there and so on. So there are great possibilities. But I'm not entirely sure that the Icelanders are too keen on advertising the advantages of the ITQ system because it gives them a competitive edge to uh, run a profitable fishery. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that the world will be moving towards this. And uh, the common fisheries policy of the European Union is a complete disaster. They are uh, subsidizing uh, the fishing fleets at the same time as they are trying to uh, restrict the size. And, uh, they, uh, and uh, another very important difference between the Icelandic system and the common fisheries policy is that the Icelandic system took into consideration the interests of the fishermen. They were consulted. Essentially, it was uh, done for them. Whereas uh, there is a great, uh, I think, gap between the fishing communities uh, in the European Union and the uh, bureaucrats in Brussels, uh, who have no understanding of this, and they send directives there. The, the great magic of the market, as, um, as described by Adam Smith, is uh, to let private interests of individuals coincide with the public interest. But that's uh, something that is not done so very well in the, the Brussels bureaucracy. Good. The next question, maybe. So, maybe okay, you can just add something. Uh, this is some, somewhat an issue of, uh, regarding privatizing the waters of the of the Black Sea, and the Black Sea is uh, is, is sort of a strange sea. It, it, this is the the, the 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 Red Sea and the Black Sea. They they have lots of sulfur. And the sulfur, now there is a methodology of using sulfur in order to produce uh, electricity and releasing water, meaning cleaning the sea. And uh, this is part of the problem. You know, nothing can start because, because the sea is sort of publicly owned. And before you start even a uh, demonstration, like 40 kilometers from, from the coast, you know, you have to ask all the governments in, uh, around, and especially Russians, they would never allow, you know, in this particular whatever conjecture on prices on oil and gas and that sort of stuff, you know, utilizing the waters of the Black Sea in order to, in order to produce electricity. And producing electricity, you know, from that source, which is virtually like 150 years, you know, just uh, whatever modest ex exploration of all the all the countries around, you know, this is just impossible to start even. Yes, I would like to comment very uh, briefly, if I may, on this, because uh, you're bringing up an extremely important point, a general point, which is this. If you do not have private profit rights, you do not have the research and development uh, that you would have if you, if you are the owner of some, something. So the experimental process of the market 
that brings uh, about more knowledge is not taking place if you have something that is called the common heritage of mankind and something that's being commonly uh, governed. So it is very important uh, to argue against this idea that you should uh, hold natural resources in, 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 in common and that uh, the, the, the custodian should be uh, the government because then you will have no uh, experiments uh, in, in doing this. And uh, what you said about... Uh, uh, these new methods is just fascinating and an ext extremely good illustration of uh, things that are unforeseen. You have a resource and uh, it has been used in one way and suddenly uh, technology enables you to use it in a d different way and, you, uh, and uh, you, you create opportunities that nobody had thought of. And this is what is so uh, fascinating about the free market. It's open-minded. There's always new and new knowledge that we can uh, acquire. One last question, or second to last, uh, the person at the back has already a microphone. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, try to have a different look on what we've been talking about and uh, the previous questions that have been asked so far. Generally, mm, when I've encountered this uh, problem with the tragedy of the commons, I see two main solutions in uh, liberal, uh, sorry, libertarian or anarcho-capitalistic circles, and one is geo-libertarianism, which is, as far as I understood, very similar to what, uh, to the example with the fishing that you gave in Iceland. Basically, you don't really have ownership, free ownership rights over uh, natural resources such as land, the oceans, air, and so on. And in a way, they are owned by the community and they just, um, even when you own them, they're kind of lended to you by the community and so you, you kind of have to pay rent or you have some other limitations such as the amount of fishing that you can do. And the other solution is say one that's proposed by some of the classics like uh, Murray Rothbard and American capitalism in particular and that is you still have absolute property rights and then because it is yours you are absolutely motivated to fish or cut trees or whatever in a sustainable way because you want to continue to have profits. And I think that these two approaches are not really very um, compatible with each other. And when you said that it, what was done in Iceland was for the benefit of the fishermen, yeah, okay, so that's one of the approaches, but could you comment on what you think are the pros and cons of these two different ways of dealing with this? I think this is a very sophisticated uh, point that you are uh, make, uh, making here and uh, quite a correct one. And I think I, I would restate it like this. In some cases, you cannot solve the problem directly by pri uh, private property rights, by allocating private property rights. And the individual transferable quotas and the Icelandic fisheries, they are not uh, fully fledged uh, private property rights. They are basically your use rights. Uh, the rights to utilize the resource in a certain way. But I would take issue with the, the uh, <coughs> contention that the fishermen ought to pay a rent to the state. Because I, I just don't think it is a very wise thing to increase uh, the possibilities for the state or revenue. Because uh, the state isn't us, it is them. And who are they? They are the politicians who are always trying to seek re-election. Basically, a re-election is an advance auction of stolen goods. An advance auction of stolen goods, like uh, Lincoln said. So uh, I, uh, I'm not uh, very happy with using uh, the enclosure of commons like the Icelandic fisheries uh, to create another source of revenue for government. I think it is much better to just let them have the profit themselves and then the profit will go out into the society itself in the very uh, way that Adam Smith uh, described in The Wealth of Nations where he discusses initial allocation of goods and he says it doesn't really matter so much because uh, people, some people will make wise use of it, others will not make wise use of it and uh, the capital and the uh, property will be distributed uh, along. So I don't worry so much about the distribution of income. Uh, for me the main thing is the creation of wealth, not the distribution of income. Sorry, uh, just a... Uh, am I over time? Is there one last question? We have uh, two minutes left. But be very short, please. Okay. Hi. Um, 
hopefully short one. Um, how do you prevent uh, in the in this aerial um, with the eight boats, which are possible to be there, from uh, one monopolistic company to own them, or do you do you have some uh, something in place? Yes, that's another question. Uh, actually, in Iceland, there is legislation uh, that prevents anyone from holding more than a certain percentage of each of the quota fees. But for a, a free market person, uh, perhaps there shouldn't be any such restrictions. On the other hand, there is a problem in, in the world. It is that uh, we have in uh, the European Union subsidized uh, fishing fleets. So what would happen if we would allow uh, the free transfer of quotas uh, in uh, a, a totally unhindered way? It would be that those who have access to the deep pockets of the Brussels people, they would buy up all the quotas. And that's not the result we would uh, like to see. If we would, however, have a free market in quotas with a quota system everywhere, I'm pretty sure that the Icelanders, with their acquired knowledge and skill in fishing, they would be net buyers of quotas, not sellers. So I, I don't think it would be a problem in a completely uh, free and unsubsidized market. Uh, to, and therefore, I w w would think that there shouldn't really be any such restrictions. Good, then uh, let's thank Professor Gisur Arsen because we don't have uh, any time left. Okay.